If you have any questions during the learning session, uh, by all means, submit those questions through the uh, question box in the GoToWebinar. We'll try to answer them at the end, uh, as many as we can, and uh, facilitate them. Uh, and the recording will be posted, as all the other ones are, to the IEM website for you to. Our speaker today is Sandra Millers Younger. Uh, Sandra is a speaker, author, and resilience mentor. Mentor uh, who lost her home, 12 neighbors, and almost her own life in the 2003 Cedar Fire, uh, the biggest wildfire in California history, uh, modern California history. Uh, with a journalism degree from the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill and Syracuse University, plus 30 years of professional experience, she felt compelled to capture this historic fire uh, for. Prosperity. Her resulting book, The Fire Outside My Window, A Survivor Tells the True Story of California's Epic Cedar Fire, has been hailed as required reading for the residents of wildfire country and adopted as a training text for top level emergency professionals. Sandra now shares the lessons of the Cedar Fire as an international speaker, workshop leader, and television guest. And she and her husband Bob were featured on NBC's Dateline. Special Escape the Great California Fire. As founder of Comeback Solutions International, Sandra also works as a consultant with disaster survivors, top level emergency professionals, and other mission driven leaders to build resistance. The skill that can transform disasters into opportunity and loss into legacy. I know many of us in the association deal with wire fires on a regular basis. And uh, we're looking forward to uh, hearing from Sandra. So, Sandra, I think I'll pass it over to you now. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Eric. And um, thanks, everyone, for joining us. We are going to switch to some slides here from my screen. And we and, can see your screen well. Thank you, Sandra. Can you? All right. Now we're going to play the slideshow. There we go. Can you see my bird? Yes, we do. All right, terrific. So today we're going to be talking about a side of emergency planning and incident management that is all too often downplayed, if not outright overlooked. We're going to be talking about the human element in disaster recovery. What I've learned both from personal observation and experience and from working with hundreds of emergency professionals now is that it's natural, given your training, to become so absorbed in dealing with the incident, ending the crisis, taking care of the injured, repairing infrastructure, rebuilding homes and businesses. All of that sometimes can cause us to forget about the aspect of disaster recovery that takes the longest which is dealing with emotional effects of trauma. You know, we teach our community members how to prepare for disasters by hardening their homes and being ready to evacuate. I have my go bag in the garage, the garage side closet right now. We teach our first responders and our disaster workers tactics. We give them equipment. We protect them with state-of-the-art protective gear from physical injury. But in my experience, and in the experience of many others I know, and according to some recent studies, the truth is that most of the time, we don't pay nearly enough attention to the, emo the emotional vulnerability that we all share as human beings. We are, every one of us, affected by traumatic situations. And that's not a flaw or a weakness, it's an asset. It means we have hearts it means we care about each other. And isn't that why people choose careers in public safety to begin with? This, this vulnerability um, to emotional effects of disaster also means that a full response to disasters must include both material and emotional support. FEMA housing, no matter how evolved, or even full replacement insurance policies just aren't enough to heal traumatized minds and hearts. 
So my first goal here today is to share with you what I've learned about the amazing ability of the human spirit to come back from adversity. Just like little mama bird here, I don't want you to miss the significance of this opening image. Can you see that she's sitting on a burned branch with twigs in her beak? She is rebuilding after a huge wildfire that destroyed pretty much her whole entire world. But she's coming back. She never questioned whether or not to reboot and rebuild. She just got busy. Mama Bird is a portrait of resilience. And we humans are naturally resilient too. No matter what gets thrown at us, we have enormous capacity to come back, often stronger than before. And especially when we practice a few principles that have been scientifically proven to boost our innate or natural resilience. So my second goal today is to equip you with a toolbox of five simple yet profound practices that do just that. They help us boost our natural resilience, which can make a big difference in how well disaster survivors, emergency professionals, and disaster workers recover from catastrophic experiences. So what's possible here? You can use these resilience keys yourself. You can share them with your communities, your teams, your families to help people better prepare, respond, and recover from the emotional effects of traumatic events. And to transform disasters into opportunities and even loss into legacy. That's the really exciting part. So specifically today, you'll learn five scientifically proven common sense principles that build resilience. And you'll learn how these principles can help us come back from setbacks faster, stronger, and wiser than before. So this webinar is for you if you're an emergency professional helping your communities prepare, respond, and recover from traumatic incidents, if you're a community corporate or nonprofit leader who works in response and recovery, if you're a disaster worker, whether paid or volunteer, who helps in the early aftermath of major incidents, or maybe you're a disaster survivor like me who wants to heal, grow, and come back stronger and wiser than before. Now, we have an hour max here, and I am skimming the cream from material that I use in half and even full day workshops. So I also want to leave time at the end for questions. So I'm going to make you a promise here. I will give you as much info as I can in the time we have together. And then before we close, I'll tell you how you can learn more if you'd like to. And I also have a little gift for you, a little souvenir. So let's jump in here. I'm going to start with a question. What was it for you? What unexpected bombshell fell out of the sky and left such a dent that it divided your entire life into before and after? It's happened to just about all of us if we've been around on the planet long enough, and we have, but it's different for different people, of course. Sometimes a serious accident or injury. Sometimes it's a devastating diagnosis. It could be a financial reversal. It could be the end of a relationship even the loss of a loved one. For me, it happened Sunday, October 26th, 2003, when my husband Bob and I woke up in the middle of the night in the middle of the biggest wildfire in modern California history, the Cedar Fire. In the months and years that followed, I learned more than I ever wanted to know about filing insurance claims. I learned how to rebuild a house from a mountain of rubble. And I also learned how to rebuild a life from the ashes of unexpected circumstances. And finally, I learned that it really is possible to transform disaster into opportunity and loss into legacy. I'm going to share those lessons with you, but before we get into all of that, let me tell you a story. About 14 years ago now, Bob and I felt ready for a change. Our kids had left home for college and we were kind of bored with the suburbs. So we thought about moving to downtown San Diego because there's a lot of great urban energy there, but we had these two ginormous Newfoundland dogs. 
think black St. Bernard's, and it just made more sense for us to move to the country. So we found this beautiful house perched on the side of a mountain about half an hour east of downtown in a place called Wildcat Canyon. There it is. A house with incredible views all the way to Mexico. Now for anyone who wonders why crazy people like me move to the wildland urban interface, this is it. This is my front yard. So the minute we stepped onto this property, we knew we found a special place. It was so special, we thought it needed a name. So we dubbed it Terra Nova, which means our new land. And we loved everything about it. The wildlife, the view, of course, hawks, coyotes, rabbits, roadrunners, even an occasional rattlesnake, and sometimes right on the front porch. We even saw a bobcat once and I thought, this is amazing, a real wildcat in Wildcat Canyon. What a tremendous place to live. But only seven months later, you already know what happened. It was a hot, windy night in late October 2003, and we woke up to the sight of fire outside our bedroom windows. Fire all across the mountain on the other side of the canyon, and this glow, this ominous glow deep below us that told us flames were racing upslope toward us. We knew we had no time, so we just called the two Newfoundlands. We had a little brainless cockatiel. We shoved her into a traveling cage. We threw a few photographs into a laundry basket and jumped into the closest car, which happened to be my little Acura Coke. It couldn't be my husband's big Chevy Suburban because we couldn't find the keys to that. Hello, disaster preparedness. So I was driving, and as I backed out of the garage into a swirl of ashes and red embers, we could see that the fire was already wrapping around our beautiful new home. There was only one way out, and it was a steep, narrow road that was carved into the side of the mountain. And just as we started down this sliver of, as sliver of asphalt, we hit the smoke, and it was thick. It was impenetrable. It was like looking out of an airplane window into a thunderhead and I couldn't see more than a foot or two in front of me. So I started yelling, I can't see the road. And Bob yelled back, well, just don't wreck the car. <laughs> now what he really meant was, don't drive off the edge. So here we are, we are lost in the smoke, teetering on the side of this mountain. And at that moment, a bobcat jumped out of the brush and landed right in front of my headlights. Just an instant, and then it dashed off into the smoke, and something in me knew that that bobcat was on the road, and something in me knew to follow it. So I followed the bobcat, and by the time I got to the spot where it had disappeared into the smoke, I could see these two fields of red below us and a dark place in between, and I realized everything ahead of us is on fire but there was no going back. So I just steered for that dark place that I knew had to be the road. And we threaded our way between two lines of fire until at last we punched through this final curtain of flames into clear night. And that is how Bob and I escaped with our two crazy Newfoundlands and our brainless cockatiel, the Cedar Fire, still the biggest wildfire in California's modern history at 280,000 acres. You know, it, it happens so fast. One day, one moment, all is well, you're living your normal life, and then suddenly, in the blink of an eye, everything changes. That bombshell falls out of the sky and divides your life into before and after. So just like that, we were homeless. We lost our beautiful new house. We were dependent now on the kindness of strangers for the most basic necessities of life, a roof over our heads, a bed to sleep in, a few borrowed t-shirts and jeans. And the media and everyone else was calling us fire victims. No, we didn't get this part. How could we be victims? We were survivors, unlike 12 of our neighbors who numbered among 17 people killed that week in San Diego County. So there I was, a journalist, a career journalist, a storyteller who'd come out of the worst part of the worst fire anyone could remember. Could remember. And two things were very clear to me. 
the first one was we had to reboot our lives and rebuild our home. Just like Mama Bird, that was not a question ever to us. It was a mandate. And two, I had to tell the story, especially for my 12 neighbors who couldn't tell it for themselves. So I set out to tell the true story of California's epic cedar fire. And on the 10 year anniversary of the fire, out popped my book, The Fire Outside My Window. Yes, it took me 10 years, but I got the job done. And in those intervening years, I did a lot of research and I interviewed a lot of people. And that's how I discovered that not everyone affected by the fire felt the same way Bob and I did about that victim survivor distinction. In fact, I met some people who seemed to embrace this victim label and it didn't seem to matter how much or how little they'd lost. In fact, the most bitter people I met had lost the least. And that's when I realized you get to choose. It's a choice. We don't always get to choose what happens to us, but we can always choose our response. We can be victims if we want to, or we can be survivors. And eventually we can recover to the point of being victors rather than victims. I love this idea so much that I started to wonder what else could we do for ourselves to facilitate our recovery. And um, I just lost my notes. So <laughs> while we get back to that, I will tell you that I found a whole body of work. People had beaten me to this question. And I realized that there were a number of academics and even philosophers who had found this body of research and they call it resilience. So I even found that there is a part of the resilience literature called post-traumatic growth. How about that? So that indicates that there is a way for us to actually capitalize on disasters and things that happen to us that we don't really choose. So this is what really started to fascinate me. And I looked into it more and more. And this is how I discovered these five principles that I now call the comeback formula. So this idea of resilience, you know, it's a buzzword lately in the emergency planning sector. And I've seen it mentioned across every phase of the emergency management cycle in prevention, mitigation, recovery. And yet, every time I hear it, it seems like we're talking about economic resilience rather than personal resilience. So what is personal resilience? Let's look at that. It's the process of adapting well in the face of adversity, trauma, tragedy, threats, or significant stress. It means bouncing back from difficult experiences. And research has shown that resilience is ordinary, not extraordinary. So being resilient doesn't mean that we don't experience difficulty or distress. It's not a trait that people either have or don't have. It involves behaviors, thoughts, and actions that can be learned and developed in anyone. This was exciting to me, and I, again, didn't make this up. This is from the American Psychological Association. So here's what we know from their research about personal resilience. We all have it. It's in our DNA. There's even a subset of resilience, as I mentioned, called post-traumatic growth. But it's also a skill that can be learned, practiced, and strengthened. So resilience research proves that there really are simple steps almost anyone can take to help them recover from almost any kind of adversity. And this is what I've boiled down into what I call the comeback formula. So here are Bob and me. Three years after the fire, as you can see, we did rebuild our home. We now maintain beautiful, defensible space. And here are the steps of the comeback formula. I'll go through them very quickly, and then we'll touch back on each one. 
So the first one is to come to a place of gratitude. If we can find even one thing to be thankful for, that is the best way to rise above this quicksand of anger and bitterness that can hold us back from growing, healing, and recovering. And next, the next four steps of the comeback formula follow the initials B-A-C-K for back. So B is to be patient with the process, even though it's likely to be painful. And yet, during this process, believe you can come back because you can. The evidence is all around us. Winter eventually turns into spring because resilience is the way of the world. It is in our DNA. The A stands for accepting help and being tough enough to ask for it when you need it. C is choose your attitude, that element of choice again. Are you going to be a victim or are you going to be a victor? You get to choose. And finally, K reminds us to keep moving forward, to embrace the new normal, because yesterday isn't coming back as much as we wish it would. It is, however, possible to build a new future that is in many ways richer than before. So these are the steps that researchers say contribute to resilience. Everything I found in the literature fits into one of these buckets, and these are the same steps that worked for Bob and me in coming back from the Cedar Fire. I only wish I'd known this in advance. I wish I'd known how effective these principles really are so that we could have focused on them in a purposeful way rather than stumbling across them as we went. And I wish we'd had them summarized in this easy to remember formula that we could check off now and then to help us stay on track during the toughest parts of our comeback journey. So that's what I've tried to create for other disaster survivors, a simple but powerful toolbox to help them rebuild their lives. But of course, the comeback formula isn't just for the public, for the community members caught in the crosshairs of disaster. Community members are not the only ones traumatized by catastrophic incidents. Here's a group of people who are also affected, disaster workers, whether paid or volunteered. Let me tell you about a couple of people I met who were both involved in the Katrina, Hurricane Creek. Katrina response. One was working with FEMA, one was part of an NGO effort, and both of them told me they experienced incredible opposition. They were even screamed at on the streets. People threw things at them because they were seen as interlopers when they were just there to help. That kind of thing leaves a mark. And of course, our emergency professionals carry enormous stress. The comeback formula is also for them. I was inside the Cedar Fire for about half an hour and it marked me for life. But many of you, many of the people you work with operate in these life and death situations for days or weeks at a time and you do it over and over again. Yes, our emergency responders are tough, highly trained professionals and we in the public see you as superheroes, rightly so. But our emergency professionals are also human and equally subject to emotional trauma. So let's take a deeper look at these five common sense principles that experience and research tell us work to mitigate disaster-related emotional trauma and help us even transform disaster into opportunity and loss into legacy. Let's go back to the first step. I think this is the most important come to a place of gratitude. This step of the comeback formula speaks to the, the knowledge that we have now that gratitude is pretty much the antidote to any negative emotion. It boosts our resilience and it increases feelings of peace and satisfaction. You know, mom was right. If you had a mom or if you know a mom who says, you better write a thank you note for that gift grandma gave you or don't expect another one. If you were that kind of mom, maybe I, I was, she was right. We moms are right. The evidence that cultivating gratitude is good for you is overwhelming. There are hundreds of studies. Gratitude is positively related to life satisfaction, vitality, happiness, self-esteem, optimism, hope, empathy, supportiveness. Who doesn't want more of that? 
On the other hand, being ungrateful is linked to anxiety, depression, envy, materialism, loneliness, yuck. This comes from research by Robert Emmons from UC Davis, University of California Davis, who authored the book, The Psychology of Gratitude. So gratitude helps us cope with trauma. Here's another researcher from the University of California, Riverside. I will not try to pronounce her last name. You can see it there on the slide. She found that traumatic memories are less likely to surface and less intense when they do in those who are regularly grateful. And even that people instinctively express gratitude when confronted with adversity, it's almost like our natural default is programming us to be grateful as a first step in coming back. Now, when I do come back formula workshops and I have a couple of hours or even a whole day to play with these steps, we do a lot of exercises designed to build them into our lives so they're not just ideas that go in one ear and out the other. And so we can really enjoy their, their benefits, um, their resilience boosting benefits long term. We don't have time for that now, but I want to give you just quickly this one gratitude exercise that you can try later on because it's super easy and it's really powerful. So here it is. Write a list of just three to five things you're grateful for. Things that are going well, things that make you happy, and then drill down. Usually, you have to drill down because usually these top level items are conceptual. Usually people say, my family, my job, my health, those are all so important and certainly reasons for gratitude, but they're conceptual, they're head concepts. What really works in gratitude is to feel it in our hearts, to feel it emotionally. So drill down and ask, why am I grateful for these things? And just keep asking yourself, why, why, why am I grateful for that? Until you start to feel a little emotionally engaged. That's when you're tapped into the level of gratitude that can really help you. Now, there have been a lot of studies about this. The one that I like, because again, this is the super easy part. And a study found that even though some people do this every day, even once a week, to just list a few things you're truly grateful for contributes to happiness and resilience just once a week. We can all do that and I recommend that we attach this practice to something we already do once a week, whatever you do on a weekly basis. Just make a little note in your calendar. I'm going to write down a couple things I'm grateful for too. All right. So that's gratitude. So powerful. The second step in the comeback formula is patience. Be patient. Be patient with the process and yet believe that you can come back. Patience, perseverance, and confidence in your ability to come back are key to recovering from disaster and loss. When you are standing on top of an ash heap that used to be your home and you're trying to look ahead and figure out how you're going to put your life back together, the road looks long and treacherous because it is. I like to say that recovery begins with tears and it takes years. There's no doubt that disaster and loss set us back. I cannot sugarcoat it. It's not unusual immediately after a disaster to wonder if we'll ever be able to recover. And it's true that life will never be the same, but the good news is that we can come back. We can believe in this ability. Resilience is in our DNA. We all know people who have come back from daunting adversity. And if we think about it, we ourselves have already come back from other challenges. That bombshell moment that you were thinking of at the top of this web webinar, you've come back from that. It's also to, important to remember that recovery is also individual. And some people find it more difficult to come back. Some people take longer. Some people bounce back more quickly. And it's important not to compare your process. Step three of the comeback formula, this is the tough one. Accept help. And that's why I've said be tough enough to ask for it when you need it. Now, it's not only wise, but essential to ask for help, to accept the help that's offered us in the wake of adversity. This is how we successfully recover. And yet, <laughs> this is so hard for us. I don't know why. I mean, can you imagine an anthill with only one ant 
or a flock of birds with only one bird? No, because ants and birds and dogs and cows and horses and humans too, we're all social creatures. We are made to support each other and be dependent on each other. Think about your greatest achievements in life. Did you do it on your own? I doubt it. You probably had help from parents, teachers, coaches, partners, mentors. This is why the Oscars show takes so long. It's all those people the winners have to thank in their acceptance speeches, right? So accepting help, even asking for it when we need it, is a basic secret of success and recovery. It speaks to issues of community and faith, concepts we hold so dear, and yet it can be the hardest step of all in the comeback journey. It was for me. I didn't want to be anybody's charity case until a friend of mine who also happened to be a psychologist pulled me aside and said, Sandra, you're resisting people's efforts to help you here. And your job right now is to be a grateful recipient, a grateful recipient. There's that gratitude piece again. And she said, I know you like giving and helping other people, but if you want to give now, if you still want to be a giver, give other people the joy and the satisfaction of helping you. See, it goes both ways. We can only give as much as we can receive. That's, that's a law. We don't think about it, but that's kind of how it works. And of course, this step can be especially hard for our emergency professionals. It's really hard to call 911 when you are 911. And yet, we know there are a few professions that are more inherently traumatic than emergency careers. No wonder the PTSD rates among our emergency responders are pretty much the same as those of combat veterans. Now, I want to share with you a new study that came out only a month ago called the Bay Area Firefighter Study that gives us some insight into this. It was conducted by a major San Francisco news team in coordination with the California Professional Firefighters Organization and International, the International Association of Firefighters. And it was triggered by the uh, ghost ship fire in Oakland, California. You may have heard about it. This happened last December. It uh, was a warehouse in downtown Oakland where people lived and 36 people were killed in that fire. More than 700 firefighters from 13 departments responded to this study and the question, the operative question here was, do you believe your stressful experiences as a firefighter caused lingering or unresolved emotional issues? 77% said yes. Yet on the whole, until very recently, like maybe the last 10 to 15 years, there's been a lack of available support for emergency responders who sacrifice so much to help others. I've talked with so many who talk about having to suck it up and suffer in silence. But of course, all of that tension comes out in other forms. Family relationships suffer, there's substance abuse, there's destructive behavior, there's even suicide. When I was researching the fire outside my window, I interviewed dozens of firefighters and law enforcement personnel who were gracious enough to share their fire stories with me. And I will tell you, almost every one of them got to a point where they choked up a little bit. It bothered them that they couldn't stop an, an unstoppable fire. It bothered them that houses burned and even worse, people died on their watch. Of course, of course it did. Of course it bothered them. If you don't take anything else away from our time together this morning, I want you to recognize that it's okay to feel the effects of your work. It's okay to share those feelings with each other. In fact, it's more than okay, it's healthy. So I hope what we learn and discuss here today will add to this growing conversation and help you build a healthy team environment that encourages open conversations and peer support. It's okay and it's actually very smart for our emergency professionals to be tough enough to ask for professional support when you need it. So as emergency leaders, it's important for you to provide quality behavioral health care for your people. Let's drop the stigma around this. We would never tell an injured firefighter to suck it up. No, we would get them to a hospital ASAP. So why do we treat emotional injuries differently? 
is not all that different for community members either. You know, Bob and I decided early in our comeback journey to go get professional counseling. It was short term, maybe six months, but that opportunity to work through all of our experiences and our reactions really helped us avoid the pitfalls of PTSD. And yet, I only know of a few people who did that, and many people had much more dramatic fire experiences than we did. So here's something I like to share whenever I speak to emergency professionals that I hope makes it easier to shift out of this old-fashioned suck-it-up mindset and embrace this step of the comeback formula to accept help and ask when we need it. It's true that we in the public see our first responders as heroes, and rightly so. These are the people who rush into danger when all the rest of us are rushing away. Well, we know a few things about heroes. We know that they all travel a similar path that's been charted out for us by this famous mythologist, Joseph Campbell, who called it the hero's journey. Now, Joseph Campbell looked at all of these archetypal legendary stories from across many cultures and many times um, in history, and he found that they all have the same elements in common. And he calls this the hero's journey. Here's the gist of it. An everyday person is called to lead his or her village, enter a new world, a new kind of dimension, and accept this huge challenge. Now, usually in the olden days, this was um, slaying a dragon or something like that. There were a lot of dragons in those days, apparently, that needed to be slain. So this person encounters tremendous obstacles and is almost killed, yet with the help of a wise mentor or guide and maybe a magical tool, our hero survives and returns to the village bearing a great treasure to share with the people. So the point I want to make here is that accepting help and being tough enough to ask for it when you need it isn't weak, it isn't wimpy, it's a critical step in the hero's journey. We cannot be successful heroes if we skip this step. Let me show you a few examples. Here's a hero. And here's his mentor. And here's the cool tool that the mentor is giving him, a lightsaber. Here's another one. Harry Potter could never have taken down Dumbledore without, I'm sorry, could never have taken down Voldemort without the help of Dumbledore. And by the way, both these characters, they already had the power in them. Luke already had the force. He just didn't know how to use it. Harry was al already the greatest wizard in the world. He just didn't know how to access his powers. So this is what mentors and guides do for us. Now let's not leave out our female heroes. Here's just one. Dorothy would never have made it home from Oz without the help of Glinda the Good Witch, who told her how to use those ruby red slippers to access the power, the resilience that Dorothy already had on her own on her own. And finally, let us not forget that sometimes help comes from unexpected sources. So that's step three of the comeback formula. Accepting help, asking when you need it. Step four is this element of choice again, to choose your response. No matter what your circumstances, you can choose your response. The way you think of yourself after loss determines how well you come back. Michael J. Fox has a great quote about this. He says, I have no choice about whether or not I have Parkinson's. I have nothing but choices about how I react to, the, to that. And there's freedom to do things in areas I wouldn't have otherwise found myself in. I also saw this after the Cedar Fire. I talked with a family who had lost their teenage daughter in the fire. And you know what they said? They said, we're not gonna be bitter about this. We're not going to let this ruin the rest of our lives. The fire took so much. We're not going to let it have any more. Not our joy, not our future. By contrast, the most bitter man I met had lost his garage in the fire, his detached garage. His home, his family, his animals were all safe. And even years later, I met up again with some fire survivors who still identified as victims. They were still bogged down in anger, resentment, and bitterness. And 
this victim mentality had become a miserable way of life. Why? Because this is the way our brain works. We get stuck in old stories and then we force every new piece of information, every new experience through that filter. So here's how to get around that. We can shift our story. We can give our brain a new mantra instead of saying, oh my gosh, this is terrible, or I'm a failure. We can say, I wonder if it's possible. I wonder if it's possible that I could be a victor in this situation. We can practice mindfulness techniques. Now, mindfulness sounds sort of woo-woo, but again, there's a whole lot of evidence-based research out there that says conscious breathing, just focusing on your breathing, meditation, yoga, a walk in nature, all of these can bring us to the present moment. And usually in the present moment, it's not nearly as bad as whatever's going on in our head. Usually we can say in the present moment that nothing is really lacking. If I ask myself this powerful question, it helps me use this step of the comeback formula. It helps me choose a more positive, a more powerful um, explanation or interpretation of the present moment. So try these things. All right, moving quickly along. Step number five of the comeback for formula is to keep moving forward. This talks to the effects of holding on to a past that can never come back. It's normal in the beginning of the comeback journey to feel shock and denial. It's just so hard to believe that things have changed so radically so quickly. And it's true that life will never be the same. It's and we're going to have to spend some time grieving our losses, but we can't heal if we try to hang on to what can never come back. Normality will return, but it will be a new normal. The opportunity here is that if we can gradually detach from our past and look to the future, we can embrace these new possibilities that Michael J. Fox talked about that would not have been available to us otherwise. It's really important here, as we look forward and detach from the past, to remember to forgive, to forgive anyone we know who might be responsible or even who we think might be responsible for our pain. It's also important to forgive ourselves because we tend to blame ourselves um, for some element in our own trauma. So I want to talk very quickly, too, about the phenomenon of post-traumatic growth. Here's a guy we all know. He embodies this idea. He shows us that sometimes the worst things in life can turn into the best things in life, and we actually can play an active role in this, in this transformation. This is what we mean by post-traumatic growth, using adversity as fuel to take us farther than we ever could have gone otherwise. So. Here's Michael's story. In 2007, Michael Phelps had a vision to be the first Olympian in history to win eight gold medals in one single Olympic Games. He was out to break Mark Spitz's long-standing record from 1972, another legendary swimmer, of course. But less than nine months before the 2008 Beijing Summer Olympics, Michael Phelps slipped and fell outside of his training facility and fractured his wrist. And people thought, oh my gosh, will he even be able to compete? But Michael Phelps never wondered that. He was like Mama Bird. He never questioned whether he was going to rebuild and reboot and come back. And Michael Phelps also tends to thrive on adversity. So here's what he did. He designed a kickboard to support his wrist, which had been surgically repaired. And he got back in the pool only a few days later. And his new training regimen became legs only. That became his new normal. Nine months later in Beijing, he was going for his seventh gold in the 100 meter butterfly and he found himself almost a half body length behind the leader. Now normally Michael depended on the strength of his freakishly long torso and arms. That was why he had become such a legendary swimmer. But now he had this powerful new kick that he had practiced by working on his weakness, to turn his weakness into a strength. So he turned on this kick and he won the gold medal by one one hundredth 
of a second. And his coach said if he had not had this broken wrist, it, this tremendous setback that Michael would not have won that race. And Michael went on to achieve his goal of eight gold medals because he embraced adversity and he even leveraged it to competitive advantage. Herman Hesse, Nobel Prize, Nobel Prize winning author, had something to say about this, about the possibility of transforming whatever life dishes out into something of value. Now we're running close to time here. I want to allow an opportunity for you to ask questions, but I also want to tell you that uh, the comeback formula starts us on this journey. We go from being a victim to a survivor. We can do that right away. We can do that just in our mental mindset. But that's not where it stops. We don't want to just survive. We don't want to float around on a life ring and bob around in the ocean forever. We want to thrive. So we come back, and then when we're living this wonderful new life, some of us, want to take another step. Some of us want to share what we've learned, and so we become givers. We give to those around us. We volunteer. We may just take over a plate of brownies to a new neighbor, but we become givers, and giving is a great way to live. A few of us, however, are called to a further step, and that is becoming what I call changers. Here are a few changers we know about on the global scene. These are people who have leveraged tremendous loss into blessings for the world. But it doesn't have to be just a global figure who's a changer. Let me introduce you to my friend, Rena. You see Rena here. This picture was taken about eight years ago with her son, Eric, who was 15. You can see he's an athlete. Well, shortly after this picture was taken, Eric dropped dead on the kitchen floor on Rena's kitchen floor. He was a victim of sudden cardiac death, which kills 7,000 young people each year in the U.S. alone. Now, Rena was a nurse. She'd never heard of this. And she was so devastated by the loss of her son that she just could barely get out of bed for months. But when she did, she determined to honor her son's memory by saving other children. So she and Eric's dad founded the Eric Peretta Save a Life Foundation. It's a nonprofit that has, in the last several years, screened 23,000 young people for heart abnormalities. And they find, on average, 1% at risk of sudden cardiac death. So Rena has saved over 200 families the heartbreak that she continues to live with every day. She found opportunity in the wake of deep disaster. She transformed her own loss into a legacy of blessings for others. This is what is possible. Never forget that you, your teams, and your communities can come back from disaster stronger than before. You can transform disaster into opportunity and even loss into legacy. So before we move into questions, I haven't forgotten that I made you a promise. I told you that if you liked what I had to share today and you wanted to learn more, I'd tell you how to do that. So here's my email address. You can email me. I also promised you a gift. So if you'd like a copy of the Comeback Formula steps, just go to comebackformula.com and you'll be able to download a PDF. And finally, I'm taking my own advice here and asking for your help in spreading the comeback message. I am currently working um, to put this information into an online format that you'll be able to roll out to your communities after a disaster. And I want to make sure that's actually a valuable resource for you. So I'd love to incorporate your input. If you have any thoughts to share, please let me know. And feel free, of course, to share my contact info with others who might be interested. Thank you so much for listening to my story today and what I've shared with you. And thanks in advance for taking action on whatever may serve you and your communities. I hope that you find the Comeback Formula a useful addition to your disaster recovery efforts. And with that, Eric, let's open it up to questions. Yeah, Sandra, thank you so much. Um, very, very deep and uh, interesting uh, topics you have, especially for those of us who have been through uh, multiple disasters over many years. So uh, good stuff. Uh, and we do have a couple of questions. Uh, one is, uh, will the slides be available for the standard question for every presentation? 
Yes, I believe that um, IAEM has recorded this webinar and will post it on your website. That's my understanding that it will be available. Okay. Uh, another uh, question uh, came in a little bit earlier, but I believe uh, you've answered it already and you may want to add more to this, but the question revolves around uh, how a mother can come back after losing her uh, children uh, during the catastrophic flood uh, in her presence. That is the deepest loss of all in my estimation. And first of all, I would say that my friend Rena's example maybe um, serendipitous that I've included it here, offers hope. Marina's come back. She's real, rebuilt her life. She misses her son terribly, but she's happy again, which she didn't think was possible. Rena also got a lot of help. Professional counseling is absolutely indicated for such deep loss, and that would be my strongest recommendation. And also to put yourself in a support group with other parents who have lost children because um, unfortunately this is an all too common experience and there is support out there. Yes, and that definitely was part of her question, can others help her, and absolutely professional support is uh, not only appreciated but, uh, you know, recommended in our industry. It's very smart, and if the first person or even the first two or three people you talk to aren't helpful to you, then keep looking. Find the help uh, you need. Find the help you need, yeah, absolutely, thank you. Uh, what can we in the EOC do to help survivors learn and adopt the five principles? And this is from uh, Jim Lamore. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, this is why I'm working to put this material online, um, to have at least the, the initial principles, or uh, maybe not the full curriculum that I've developed around this, but I'm working to put at least the, the fundamental principles online in a format that ideally you would be able to roll out to your communities. Um, in disaster. So, Jim, I would really love to talk with you about that because I do want to make this available to you. Um, and I'm working on that right now. I'm also going to put this information into a book so it will be available, I hope, sometime next year. And next question, in your personal experience, how much assistance and support did you receive from local, state, and the federal government? None. Um, well, I might, I might amend that a bit. I think we got a little bit of expedited help with our building permit. I think there are a few fees were waived. Um, FEMA is only helpful if you don't have insurance, but we still had to fill out all the paperwork, which, you know, adds another item to a very long to-do list. Um, in our case, it was a blessing that we had great private insurance because the government help was not significant. And, and I guess, Eric, that's why I feel so strongly about this. I mean, why can't we, uh, as government and community entities, provide some resource that people can refer back to long term. It's great when their shelter's set up and Red Cross comes in and other nonprofit groups, but then they go home and they redeploy to other incidents and, and people are there for years left with this lingering, um, this lingering trauma. So my hope is to see some sort of resource that governments can employ as part of their post-disaster recovery plan that offers just a, a touchstone of principles proven to work to help us move through trauma into recovery. That's my dream. Well, I think, uh, I think we all uh, very much appreciate your, uh, your thoughts and uh, help in this area. Uh, having been a first responder and emergency manager for many years, I would agree that the uh, psychological impacts are often uh, overlooked. And 
and uh, you know, all disasters are local, so that support has to start at home. So uh, thank you very much, Sandra. I think this uh, resonates uh, very well with uh, with our community. I hope so. Thank I hope you. it serves you. Thank you for the opportunity, Eric, and thanks to everyone who joined us. No, no, not my opportunity. Absolutely, thanks to the association and the team members like Chelsea and Dawn and uh, Ken who uh, who work in the background to help us uh, make this happen. I'd like to thank everyone for uh, joining the Thursday Learning Series. Very much appreciated. Uh, please make sure to join us for the next uh, Thursday Learning Series, Mapping the Social Media of Disaster Survivors. Uh, always a great topic, uh, which will be Thursday, August 3rd at 1 to 2. Uh, remember that we do have uh, chats on Twitter at 12.30 uh, on Fridays for, uh, for those who are into the social media side of emergency management. And that will be with uh, Sarah Smith. And uh, by all means, uh, if you have any recommendations, comments, concerns, questions, uh, please feel free to uh, forward them along uh, to myself, uh, Chelsea, the association, uh, and of course, uh, make sure to reach out to Sandra uh, with the good work she's doing. Um, thank you so much, uh, everyone who attended, Sandra and, uh, and the team. Have a great weekend.